Hallo und herzlich willkommen aus dem karl Renn institut Mein Name ist Sebastian Schublach und ich leite bei uns im Haus den Bereich internationale Politik. Wir haben uns schon sehr gefreut, nach langer, langer Zeit endlich wieder einen internationalen Gast live hier in Wien vor Ort bei uns begrüßen zu dürfen. Aber wie wir nicht aus den letzten Tagen wissen, es kommt oft anders als erhofft. Und aller politischen Bedeuerungen zu Trotz ist die Pandemie doch noch nicht ganz am Ende. Deshalb haben wir uns beschlossen, den amerikanischen intellektuellen Professor Robert Kattner heute live aus den USA zuzuschalten. Das äh, ist auch gut fürs Klima und wir können trotzdem das Gespräch via Zoom führen. Falls ihr Fragen habt an Herrn Kattner, nur her damit, egal ob ihr via Facebook, via Zoom oder via YouTube zuschaut, ihr könnt einfach eure Fragen und Anregungen in den Kommentaren posten und ich werde sie dann gerne weiterleiten. Wir werden nur kurz zum Ablauf mit einer kurzen Präsentation starten, mit einer Rede von Herrn Kattner und gehen dann direkt in die Diskussion. Wie ihr gelesen habt, werden wir heute auf Englisch die Veranstaltung durchführen und deswegen werde ich jetzt auch die Sprache wechseln. So now I will switch to English. Bob, uh, thank you so much for taking the time and being with us today. Um, please let me briefly introduce you. You are co-founder and co-editor of the American Prospect, a progressive political magazine based in Washington, D.C., but you also write for the Huffington Post, the Boston Globe, and the New York uh, Review of Books. You are a professor in social planning and administration at Brandeis University based in Boston. Uh, you have uh, written and published numerous books, uh, the two latest being Can Democracy Survive Global Capitalism and The Stakes 2020 and the Survival of American Democracy. Uh, and last but not least, you're also an expert uh, on the works and the life of Karl Polanyi, the great Vienna-born intellectual, and to use your words, 20th century, uh, century's most prophetic critic of capitalism. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, and without further ado, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Sebastian. And uh, <clears throat> thank you to the Renner Institute for hosting this lecture, which is the first in a series of four lectures uh, in the spirit of, of Karl Polanyi. Uh, I should say with a with a surname like Kuttner, I should be doing this in German, but uh, it's ironic. Uh, Polanyi should be better known in the German speaking countries. He is unfortunately much better known in the English speaking countries. Uh, before proceeding to the to the subject of what's going to happen after neoliberalism, let me say a little bit about neoliberalism. The, the premise of neoliberalism is that markets can regulate themselves and that government is inherently incompetent, captive, or corrupt, and an intrusion on the efficiency of the free market, and that in distributive terms, market outcomes are basically disturbed, uh, deserved, that uh, redistribution creates perverse incentives by punish, punishing the economy's winners and rewarding its losers, so governments should just get out of the way. And somehow, the bitter lessons of the 1920s and 1930s no longer apply. Well, after something like half a century of this great experiment in neoliberalism, the verdict is in. Every one of the neoliberal policies has failed, even in its own terms. Uh, enterprise has been rewarded. Taxes have been cut. Regulation has been reduced. Public entities have been privatized and the economy is vastly more unequal, yet uh, economic growth is slower and more chaotic uh, than during the era of managed capitalism. Deregulation has not produced more salutary competition, it's produced uh, more economic concentration. And economic power has resulted in feedback loops of political power in which uh, elites make the rules that benefit further concentration. Neoliberalism, as I've written, is an economic failure, but a political success. We have won on the reality. We have won on the theory. We have not yet won on the power distribution or on the necessary institutions. 
And the culprit is not just markets, as if some kind of impersonal force got loose once again. This is a story of power using theory. The mixed economy was undone by an economic crisis, uh, which benefited economic elites who then revised the rules for their own benefits. And they invested in friendly theorists to validate this shift as necessary and sound economics. Recent years have demonstrated the catastrophe of letting markets loose. Nicholas Stern uh, has described global climate change as history's greatest case of market failure. And perhaps history's second greatest market failure uh, is the collapse of 2008, which, the result, which was the result of deregulating uh, finance. So uh, there has been a great reversal of the economy that people of my generation uh, grew up with, the economy of uh, uh, the post-war boom, the 30 glorious years. And uh, you ask the question, what happened? Why was the post-war boom and the institutions and the ideology and the practices of the post-war boom uh, reversed? We grew up, my generation, thinking of the post-war social settlement, if you will, as the new normal. Uh, but in fact, it was not the new normal uh, at all. Uh, it resulted from an anomalous harmonic convergence of events, which was really unique in, in the history of capitalism. The dynamics were different in Europe and in America, but the result was the same. In Europe, you had the far right, the fascist right, uh, being discredited by World War II. You had the libertarian right, the free market right, the Hayekian right, being discredited by the events that led up to World War II. And so in 1946, 47, 1948, in Western Europe, there were no libertarians and there really were no fascists, either in government or contending for positions in government. In the United States, the counterpart was that the Great Depression and the financial crash that preceded the Great Depression discredited the Republican Party, discredited laissez-faire, uh, ushered in the most popular president in democratic history, who used government, used the state to empower labor, to regulate capital, to limit the political power and the institutional power of finance, to demonstrate what uh, organized democratic government could do. And so by 1944, when it was clear that uh, the allies were gonna win the war, and you have the Bretton Woods Conference. The Bretton Woods Conference was really an effort to bring to the entire Western economic system uh, a set of structures of finance and monetary policy that would allow full employment to be practiced country by country uh, in every single nation state. And uh, the chairman of the Bretton Woods Conference was John Maynard Keynes. This was Keynes's do-over he had failed to persuade uh, the powers at the Versailles Conference that they were creating a catastrophe. And so 25 years later, as Lord Keynes, Baron Keynes of Tilton, he got a chance to do it right. He got a chance to create the conditions of a post-war recovery that would uh, be politically and economically sustainable and that would produce full employment uh, country by country. Now, the, the, the great documents of that era were all documents about the importance of full employment. Uh, beverages document, full employment in a free society. Uh, the documents in the United States in 1944 and 1945 about post-war economic planning. And then after maybe 30 years, this splendid anomalous social contract turned out to have a half-life of only one generation. Uh, the instability of the 1970s uh, gave the right uh, another turn. And the lessons of the 1920s and 30s somehow vanished. And we all know the benchmarks, the collapse of Bretton Woods, the inflation, the reaction against that inflation to tighten money, and then the uh, uh, election of Reagan and Thatcher and the implementation of, uh, of all sorts of neoliberal policies. Now, 
this period of the 70s uh, has received a great deal of study, but I think the period of what happened after the 70s is worth even more study. Uh, in the Anglo-Saxon countries, the uh, instability of the 1970s brought the right to power, Reagan and Thatcher. But in France, it brought the left to power. And Francois Mitterrand comes to power as a, as a full-blooded socialist. And um, I often distinguish between what happened to Mitterrand and what happened to Clement Attlee in the great post-war labor government uh, of 1945 in the United Kingdom, in Britain. Uh, Attlee, despite the fact that Britain uh, had lost one quarter of its national wealth during World War II, Attlee was able to build a kind of socialist or social democratic uh, welfare state. Mitterrand, after two years, had to reverse course and uh, practice something like neoliberalism with the human face. What had changed since 1944 and 1981? The rules of global capitalism had changed. In 1945, the rules were such that you could not speculate against the pound. Under the Bretton Woods Agreement, exchange rates were fixed. There were capital controls. So there was no speculation in currencies. But by 1981, that set of rules had been blown away and uh, speculators started betting against the franc. And after two, uh, two devaluations and failed attempts at capital controls, uh, Mitterrand had to just uh, govern like uh, another neoliberal with a little bit of... Uh, of uh, welfare state around the edges. And then what happens next is even more shameful. You have nominally progressive leaders in the United States, in Germany, and in Britain adopting neoliberal policies, Schroeder, Blair, and Clinton. And uh, they believed in deregulation of finance. They believed in balanced budgets, every bit as much as the conservatives. And so when these policies led to the collapse of 2008 and people asked for a different menu, people asked, where's the opposition program? The left wasn't providing an opposition program because the left had turned into the center left and the center left was part of the neoliberal consensus. And so a lot of that uh, reaction in Polanyi terms, double movement, a lot of that reaction goes to the far right. And then if you need one more uh, reason for why the right profited from this, you have the refugee crisis. And center left parties as good social liberals uh, were liberal on refugees, liberal on migration. That's rather difficult to pull off even when times are good. When you have unemployment rates of 10 and 12 and 15%, uh, it's almost uh, impossible uh, to pull off. And so the counter movement goes right rather than left. And you also have a kind of peculiar uh, cultural inversion in that a lot of the people who are supporting uh, social democratic parties, green, green parties, are not really the working class. They're uh, cosmopolitan social liberals who are upper middle class who are supporting left parties on the basis of environmentalism or gay and lesbian rights or cosmopolitanism uh, and the working class is moving to the right. So culture has interfered with class politics. And of course, in the United States, the counterpart is racism. In the EU, it's more about immigration. And speaking of the EU, one further problem is the shift from the European Economic Community uh, to the European Union of the Maastricht Treaty. The, the original uh, European Economic Community was merely a customs union. Each nation state was free to manage capital, manage capitalism, have public ownership, have constraints uh, on imports, uh, as long as it was a, was a customs union but it could favor its own domestic industry. It could have industrial policies. Uh, it could uh, regulate capital in all kinds of ways. Along comes the Maastricht Treaty, and that requires absolutely free movement uh, 
of services, goods, capital, and human beings, which makes it really, really difficult to have the kind of regulated capitalism that we had uh, during the post-war era. And the European Court of Justice has overturned one state regulation after another on the regulation of labor, on the regulation of capital as being uh, inconsistent with Maastricht. The EU had one other uh, perverse consequence, which only became obvious after the collapse of 2008. So a crowning achievement of Maastricht, of course, is the creation of the Euro. And for a while, this was great for Greece and Italy and Portugal and Spain, which had been accustomed to paying uh, more money to finance its debt. And people said, well, uh, now we don't have that problem anymore. And so Southern Europe begins paying interest rates uh, almost as low as, as Germany. And of course, the people who said that this would not be a problem overlooked the more serious possible problem of default. And under the terms of Maastricht as in, enforced particularly by, by Germany as a condition for having given up the Deutschmark, um, you had to have very stringent budget rules on both deficits and on debts. And so when Greece gets into trouble, instead of uh, viewing the EU as a true federation that needs to help its, uh, its weakest partners, well, uh, enlightened opinion in Northern Europe is these people need to be punished. Even though the, uh, the Greek difficulties were not uh, the fault of the social democratic government, PASOK, they were the fault of the previous conservative government which had faked the budget. But um, the power of the EU to enforce austerity was such that it destroyed PASOK and then it even destroyed Syriza, uh, a further left um, political coalition. And uh, as you know, uh, about the worst thing you can say in Germany anyway, and maybe also Austria, is we should not have a debt union. There's a kind of view that the Southern European nations are club med who uh, live uh, irresponsibly and Northern Europe, which, which uh, lives more prudently, uh, should not be bailing them out. So where does this leave us today? Uh, we have won on the reality, we have won on the theory, neoliberalism has been disgraced in practice, and yet we really don't have the preconditions to put back together anything like the political coalition or the institutional circumstances that uh, prevailed after World War II. Globalization and deregulation and uh, the deregulation of labor and capital have led to a situation where the political distress, uh, as you see in Austria, and as we saw under President Trump uh, in the United States, all of that anxiety goes to the right because the democratic left ha has lost a lot of credibility and the institutions are not there uh, to put it back together. Now, uh, there's, there's one paradoxical bit of hope in this rather bleak situation, and that is, of all places, the United States of America. And uh, in a way, we've come full circle, right? It, it was Roosevelt and Bretton Woods and the American um, ideology of that era that then creates the institutional conditions for post-war Europe to reform and rebuild its economy on terms that are egalitarian, on terms that empower labor, on terms that use the democratic state to temper the excesses of free market capitalism, that use the democratic state to regulate multinational finance. And so you have this period of stability where in Western Europe, as I said, we had this 30 year period where there's a balance between the power of capital and labor and life gets better for ordinary people. Not only does the economy grow at record rates, but the economy becomes more equal. Now you don't have the preconditions anywhere in Europe to replicate that. You've got uh, the constraints of the EU, 
and you've got fragmented parliamentary systems in every major European country. Take the case of Germany. Um, the Social Democrats just barely won an election, but because they won it with only about a quarter of the vote, they're gonna have to go into coalition, assuming that they get the chancellorship with not only the Greens, but with the FDP, which is the economic liberals. So they're gonna to have to go into coalition with their ideological opposite, which means that no bold policies are, are possible. And if you think about it, the same thing is true in the United States. The Democratic Party is nominally the majority party, it's the governing party, but the Democratic Party is also a coalition party. It's got fiscal conservatives. And unfortunately, Biden has such a narrow governing majority that he has to win the votes of the fiscal conservatives uh, as well as the progressives. So on the one hand, you have this marvelous, almost miraculous situation of, of Biden having rediscovered the New Deal, uh, governing as a kind of Roosevelt Democrat, uh, rejecting the neoliberalism of the last three Democratic presidents, but not quite having the votes uh, to do it right. And uh, we don't see this anywhere in Europe. We've really got one durable left coalition anywhere in Europe, and that's, that's in Portugal. And so I go back to Polanyi. Uh, Polanyi, as you may know, after he writes his great book, The Great Transformation in 1944, he lived another 20 years, and he was very critical of European social democrats for not being socialist enough. Because the problem with welfare capitalism, the problem with managed capitalism, is that it's too feeble to constrain the political power of capitalists in an economy that is still ultimately capitalist. And so it becomes unstuck when circumstances change. And um, Biden, in order to succeed, is going to uh, have to be even more socialistic than Roosevelt was, because with public ownership, and here I think of Red Vienna, uh, Polanyi's Red Vienna in the 1920s, if you have public ownership uh, of at least some institutions, it's more durable. Now, the question is, how on earth do we get back to the political and institutional conditions that prevailed uh, during uh, that golden era of managed capitalism, and how do we go beyond it to something more like democratic socialism? Uh, reading Polanyi helps, but it only helps a little bit. Uh, the task of our generation is to fashion the politics and build something that working people can count on. So I leave the particulars of that to the discussion, and I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bob, for this very interesting insights. Um, I have a few questions, and I have already received a few questions uh, as well, and I would like to to you know, take a few questions in and 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 ask you to answer them if, if possible. So we have one question regarding um, the belief system within neoliberalism. So the question is why uh, proponents of neoliberalism seem to be stuck in the belief that only the state can be corrupt when it should be obvious that participants of a free market could be equally corrupt, at least as corrupt, I may add. Then there was one contradiction that there uh, was in fact uh, fascism uh, in Europe after the Second World War, namely in, in Spain and Portugal. Um, and uh, also adding uh, a question to Spain, is there no left coalition in Spain? But I think you, you mentioned um, the durability uh, and the feasibility of the coalition in Portugal, uh, but maybe you could elaborate on that as well. Uh, and then there's hold on because I can't yes. remember all these questions. <laughs> okay, I will I will sum it up afterwards. Um, okay. okay, then then we, we stop right here and I'll take the next question. Yeah, let, let, let me just take them maybe two at a time so I can okay, two at a time. So okay. corruption in new liberalism versus a uh, state versus uh, free market society, yeah. fascism in Europe, coalition in Spain. Uh, yeah. Let me <laughs> let me address the first question first. I mean, obviously, it's an opportunistic inconsistency in the theory. And in fact, uh, the state 
is is vulnerable to corruption, but the state uh, is somewhat more accountable to the voters than corruption in corporations. The 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 whole structure of 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 regulation of finance was intended to bring some sunlight into the workings of the corporations. But after 70 years, corporations have figured out how to keep their activities much more in the dark. Uh, the whole private equity system is an effort, it's, it's a lot of things, but among other things, it's an effort not to have to disclose anything about the enterprise to the regulatory authorities. It's private equity. And the fiction is that there are no shareholders. Well, in fact, there are shareholders, they're just called limited partners. And so if anything, despite the theory of neoliberalism and the theory of markets, uh, actual institutions, as opposed to the idealized markets of Adam Smith or Milton Friedman, actual corporations and banks are, are far less amenable to the discipline of the market than what you, what you get in economic theory. So it's a complete uh, inconsistency and hypocrisy in, uh, in neoliberal theory. And now, um, what specifically was the question about uh, fascist Spain and Portugal? I think you mentioned mentioned that uh, there was no there were no fascist governments um, after the forties in Europe, and I think the ah okay more or less contradiction was that the, the, there were in fact two fascist governments yeah. or regimes. Yeah, so um, take them one at a time. I, I mean, uh, Spain, of course, had been neutral uh, during the war, even though it was allied with Hitler. And so the allies made a decision that they did not want to invade Spain. They did not want to overthrow uh, Franco. This was a tactical decision. Uh, uh, Portugal, I, I think, was its own special case. Portugal very astutely um, allied itself with NATO. And so they left Portugal alone. So yeah, you're right. I should have mentioned Iberia as a kind of a special case, but I was referring to uh, most of Western Europe. Okay, and then there was one one question because you mentioned Portugal as being uh, one one exception um, mm. in Europe. Yeah, well, if you look around the nations of the EU, the last time I looked, uh, there were maybe six governments in the EU that are led by social democrats, except that every one of them is a coalition government, and almost all of them are dependent on centrist parties for their majority. So you have situations uh, like in, in uh, Sweden where you have a social democratic prime minister, but he can't do anything because uh, the policy is reliant on the support of a, of a non-socialist party. The, 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 the strongest exception to that rule is in Portugal where you have a socialist prime minister who's supported by two other left parties and it's a popular government, it's a fairly durable government. And, but <laughs> to look at all of Western Europe and to realize that there's one country and it's one of the smaller countries in Western Europe that's actually led by a durable left government that's a serious left government, that doesn't exactly inspire hope. And, um, you know, if things had broken differently in Germany and you had the possibility of uh, a coalition government that included the SPD and the Greens and Die Linke, that might have been different, but, but Die Linke just lost worse than anybody. They lost half of their votes in the last election. And uh, Schultz was not eager to go into coalition with Die Linke anyway. So it, it's gonna be a long road back. And that's, so Biden's success is, is terribly important in, for the survival of democracy in the United States, but it's also important for the rest of the West. And I see a note that says Spain was not neutral. Well, in fact, it was not neutral. It was allied with Hitler. Nominally, it was neutral. Okay. Um, to leave the, the Iberian Peninsula for a second, um, there was another question, um, and I will read it out. Could you please explain shortly why the unregulated speculation with currencies is so dangerous? Um, you mentioned it with regard to uh, Mitterrand's France. France. 
France, sorry. So um, one of the things that happens is that countries are pressured to practice austerity in order to win the confidence of financial speculators. Because when financial speculators see budget deficits or see strong trade unions or see regulation or see progressive tax systems, uh, then they avoid that currency. This was the great insight of Keynes at Bretton Woods. If you want to create the preconditions to manage capital and to have full employment economies country by country, uh, you can't have speculation in currencies. And Greece is sort of the extreme example of that, right? In, in, in order to reassure the creditors, the ECB and the European Commission and the IMF kept putting more and more pressure on Greece to practice more and more austerity to reassure bondholders. Instead of understanding how perverse this was, uh, they could have put the bondholders out of business overnight by simply shoring up <laughs> the Greek financial sy system. And then people would have stopped betting against Greek sovereign debt. And so uh, in order to prevent this kind of downward spiral where countries compete with each other to see which ones are practicing more austerity to reassure more financial speculators, you either prohibit that kind of speculation or you have central bankers making bets on the opposite side of the bet to punish the speculators or you have fixed exchange rates or you have capital controls. Now in Bretton Woods, you had both fixed exchange rates and capital controls. Uh, in, within the EU, you have a single currency, but you have a single currency combined with austerity economics and so it's it's just as bad as uh, as uh, allowing bets against currencies because you don't have bets against currencies, but what you have is bets against sovereign debt by international financial speculators. Okay, thank you. Um, I will now continue with my own questions uh, until further questions from the audience arise. And I would like to talk a little bit about um, Karl Polanyi um, and, we talked about this briefly, and you mentioned it. Um, it's it's interesting that he's um, uh, he's he was born in Vienna. He was a journalist for the Österreichische Volkswirt, which was the so to say the Economist uh, of Europe one hundred years ago. Um, but he's not that well known in the German speaking world. So, for those who have never heard of Karl Polanyi, or for those who are not that familiar with his work, could you explain why, in your eyes? His analysis can help us understand current political developments. What what is it that makes um, Polanyi's ideas so popular in current in the current situation? So to pick up with his life story, uh, after the fascist takeover, Polanyi obviously has to leave Vienna, and uh, he ultimately makes his way to London, where his uh, English friends. Uh, find a job for him uh, teaching in an extension school for workers that's loosely affiliated with Oxford University. And there he begins his great life work of researching the history of capitalism. And um, unlike Marx, who covers a lot of the same ground, uh, Polanyi has the benefit of writing about 75 or 80 years after Marx. And a lot of interesting things happen after Marx. And uh, one of the interesting things that happens, of course, is fascism in, in Europe in, in the 1920s and 1930s. And um, Polanyi also is a more astute student of economic liberalism in the 19th century th than Marx was, as practiced. So Polanyi says that the essence of economic liberalism was to treat labor like a commodity. Labor has to find its uh, price on the market and to promote total free trade and um, to uh, allow free movements of capital. And, um, and he says, and to try to marketize everything. 
Now, in this respect, of course, he's convergent with Marx. Where he diverges from Marx in one profound, fundamental way, uh, Marx, uh, wearing his revolutionary hat, as opposed to his hat as a historian and an analyst, concludes that uh, when the reaction to uh, the oppression of capitalism happens, uh, workers of all nations will unite. Polanyi, writing 75 years later, realizes that what happens when you have the reaction against the attempt to turn everything into a market, uh, workers turn to ultranationalism. They don't unite with their brother and sister workers of other countries. They, they turn to fascists. And this, of course, is the experience in, uh, in Italy and then uh, in Germany, and happily not elsewhere in most of Western Europe. But uh, that was enough to uh, create uh, World War II. And um, so Polanyi's conclusion is that um, if you don't want this uh, reaction against the attempt to turn everything into a market, which makes everybody horribly insecure, to go to the far right, you need to figure out a way to have it go to the democratic left. And this was not just a matter of theory. He had lived in Red Vienna in the 1920s. He understood how a progressive democratic socialist government could work. And one of the things that was absolutely central to his analysis was that the only reason you could have anything like Red Vienna in the 20s was that it empowered workers, that it was strong worker organizations that were the constituency for a democratic uh, socialist government. And interestingly, if you look at what happens to Polanyi after the war, so he writes the Great Transformation uh, while he's a lecturer at Oxford. It's then, he, he then moves to the United States. Uh, Bennington College offers him a visiting professorship and uh, it's a small progressive college in the state of Vermont. And he stays there for a while and uh, wants to settle in the United States. He's offered a teaching position at Columbia, but his wife, uh, who was a communist, is barred from entering the United States. And so they end up in Canada, which is why one of the main uh, centers of Polanyi scholarship is, uh, is in Montreal. And he lives another 20 years. He lives until 1964. And during this interesting period between the time the Great Transformation is published and the time he dies, he's very critical of the social democratic governments of that era for not being socialist enough. He's critical of the great labor government of 1945 of Clement Attlee. He's critical of the uh, German SPD. He's sympathetic to the DDR. I mean, he's a real socialist. He's, and, and every time uh, <laughs> he's described as a social Democrat, his daughter, Kari, who's now in her mid nineties gets furious. And she says, my father was not a social Democrat. He was a socialist. And that's true. But I think, where Polanyi is more prophetic than Marx is that he understands the danger of the reaction going to the far right. And of course, this is exactly what has happened in all of our countries. It's what happened in the United States when the Democratic Party stopped serving working people and you get Trump, uh, classic Polanyi, using racist nationalism as a substitute for actually serving uh, worker interests. And um, uh, tragically, uh, because Polanyi, I have a particular sympathy for Polanyi, by the way, because he was a journalist. And I'm a journalist who also pretends to be a college professor, as, as was Polanyi. And um, Polanyi ranged across many, many disciplines. Was he a historian? Was he an economist? Was he a sociologist? Was he a troublemaker? Well, he was all of the above. But because of that, he doesn't neatly fit into any disciplinary tradition, which means that students don't get assigned his work and 
if, if you look at the meetings of uh, various Polanyi societies, they attract historians, economists, sociologists, uh, people from different disciplines, but there's no one discipline that sort of uh, economic anthropologists have adopted Polanyi. But there's no real one discipline that, that, that is his, which is one of the reasons why I think uh, he's not uh, better known. Um, you, you, have, you have mentioned um, the importance of his experience uh, in Vienna of this, this interwar period. Um, could you could you elaborate a little bit on that? Um, why was this this? It, it was a very brief but successful uh, experiment of municipal socialism, um, and and many of the social housing uh, like Karl Marx of etc. still exist today. And and uh, you know, it's it, for for social for Austrian social democracy. It's it's um, uh, it's still a very important point of, of reference. Um, why was this experience um, so important for his work? Well, I think he lived it. So he, he's an economic journalist during much of that period, but he's also uh, very much of a socialist. And um, dur during this period, um, the, the, chamber, the, the Chamber of Commerce is supporting this privat seminar Uh, that Hayek ends up controlling, and um, he ends up debating Hayek, and he becomes the great antagonist of the ultra liberals of that era. And I'll tell you one interesting story. Um, so Hayek writes this book, The Road to Serfdom, which comes out in uh, 1944, the same year that the Great Transformation uh, comes out, and um, Hayek's book becomes a bestseller. And uh, Polanyi's book hardly sells any copies. And the reason that Hayek's book becomes a bestseller is that the right wing puts all this money into publicizing Hayek's book. And they even arrange to have the New York Times assign a review of Polanyi's book by Hayek's principal publisher, so that the New York Times ends up attacking Polanyi's book. Now, I like to say that the free marketplace of ideas is one more market that doesn't work like the model. Uh, there's a, the, the invisible hand places a thumb on the scale of the supposed free marketplace of ideas. And so Hayek's work becomes much more influential. Why? Because there's a market for Hayek's work. It's called capital. All of the capitalists love what Hayek is saying and they don't like what Polanyi is saying. And there's all of this money today to support neoliberal research, not very much money to support heterodox research. So we, we keep winning the arguments and we keep losing the politics. Um, I see there is at least two more questions. Um... In Austria, and I guess that's true for, for many other countries, um, there have been more and more privatizations in the last decades whenever conservative parties have been in power. But in turn, uh, nationalizations or socializations have practically not happened. Um, so why are these continuous privatizations so problematic and should social democratic parties insist on more socialization? And then there's another question. Um, Uh, which are the international social intellectuals you would recommend to read? So again, the, the uh, embrace by the so-called center left of a lot of neoliberalism in the era of Schroeder and Blair and Clinton, that's continuing. Uh, the idea that private is more efficient than public It's only with Biden in the United States that uh, the Democratic Party has reversed course. Uh, also, if you have um, fiscal stress, and the idea is that it's terribly important to balance the budget, one way of balancing the budget is to sell off assets. And I think that's happened uh, all over the West. You also have the EU and the, and the OECD pressuring privatizations. Uh, 
uh, under Maastricht, um, private entities are supposed to create, be able to compete with government entities. So you have partly privatized postal service. But if you get down off the level of high theory and you look at how actually this works in practice, you know, you have couriers being paid by the piece, making very low wages, and you don't have enough money to invest in modern technology. And research is starting to show that public post offices are more efficient than their privatized alternatives. But you have this immense inertial institutional pressure to keep privatizing. And then, you know, if you, if you sell off state assets, that's a one-time gain for your budget. It's, it's absolutely insidious. And um, one of the things that Biden has revived is the ancient tradition of postal banking. It's now being done on a pilot project basis, but in some cities now in the United States, you can go to your post office and open a bank account. And so we need a reversion back to public institutions, which are less easily captured by neoliberalism. Now, the question was who, 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 who you would recommend read? <laughs> What should we read? Who? Do, yeah. Um, Except, uh, um, your new book, which is about to come next year, and uh, and Carl Polanyi, obviously. Yeah, my new book is called Going Big. It's about Biden and Roosevelt. Um, and um, actually, my my book that I published in 2018 called Democracy Can Survive, Can Democracy Survive Global Capitalism, is the bigger, more serious book. Uh, I would say my favorite economist is Joseph Stiglitz. Um, he's, you know, he doesn't quite call himself a socialist, but he's certainly a critic of the excesses of, of free markets. Um, on environmental issues, I like Nicholas Stern at the London School of Economics. Um, um, I wasn't, I, I didn't realize this was going to be on the exam, so I didn't prepare for this. <laughs> I think uh, it's good. I think, I think that's, that's good. I mean, you could. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. There's a, there's a, there's a wonderful woman named Mariana Matsukato who has uh, written excellent books on the state role in economic development. And, and who will be, by the way, our guest in December, because you will receive, uh, the Kurt Rothschild Prize for, for Wirtschaftspublizistik, um, which we award to her together with uh, the parliamentary group uh, of the SPÖ. So yeah. stay so tuned. <laughs> yeah, so she, but, but she's a real scholar and she's done all the work to demonstrate why, you know, if you go back centuries and centuries, the state actually has a, has a major role in economic development. And this is certainly true in Germany. Uh, which was the country uh, in the 1830s, 1840s that rejected all of the tenets of Adam Smith and realized that uh, in order to compete, the state had to involve itself in economic development. Okay, thanks for, for these uh, recommendations. I have a few more questions regarding um, the United States because you mentioned the, the USFA as a possible uh, example of how, how things could, could go. Um, I, the, my first question is um, with regards to the Republican Party. So very few people saw it coming in 2016, but, but Trump, Trump has not only succeeded in the primaries, but has also captured the Republican Party. So what, what role does he play today, even after not being uh, re-elected as president, even after losing both uh, the Senate and the House, and, and, and even after the violent uh, fascist uh, attacks on the Capitol. What role does he play, and why is it so difficult for the Republican Party to get rid of him? Yeah. Well, he's an example of the danger of the charismatic fascist leader, that people have just decided that he is the, the Fuhrer, the savior, and uh, the, the hardcore of the Republican base which is maybe 60 or 70 percent of the Republican electorate, which is maybe 35 percent of the country, um, 
no matter what Trump does, will not cease being loyal to Trump. Now, that in turn has had reverberations on Republican politicians. So they have decided that Trump is so popular with the Republican base that they do not dare oppose him. And um, it's to the disgrace of the traditional Republican Party. But um, what has happened to anti-Trump Republicans is they either keep retiring or they will be deposed in primary elections next year, or they are ostracized uh, by the institutional Republican Party. So the classic case of this is Liz Cheney, the, the daughter of the former vice president, who was a, was a real right winger. I mean, vice President Cheney was about as far right as you could go in the traditional Republican Party. So his daughter is a member of Congress from the state of Wyoming, a very conservative state, but she has decided that Trump is a fascist and she's standing up against Trump. So the Republican caucus in the House of Representatives stripped her of all of her party positions and they will run a candidate against her uh, in the primary elections in 2022 and they may well beat her. So the problem is other Republican politicians look at this and they don't dare oppose Trump. Trump, assuming his health holds up, assuming he's not in prison, uh, will run for the renomination in 2024. And in some respects, it's reminiscent of the German politicians of the traditional conservative parties in 1932, thinking that Hitler could be used. And of course, the dictator ends up using them. I have a follow-up question. Um, because you, you mentioned uh, that President Biden has reversed neoliberal policies, but is this kind of part, part reversal and, and practical help for working class people, has it done anything to alter the allegiances um, to Trump amongst working class voters? Oh, and, and if yes, how? And if not, what would actually alter those allegiances? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think uh, not, the, the answer is not very much. I, I think the, the allegiance to Trump is so tribal and so cultural, if you will, that it's very, very difficult for practical help to change that very much. So, for example, one of the things that uh, was enacted in March of uh, this year in the first uh, reconstruction and relief program that Biden was able to get through Congress, and that was $1.9 trillion. That was a lot of money. So they included in that a universal basic income for parents a universal children's allowance of uh, $300 a month per child, uh, $360 if the child is under six. So, you know, if you have three kids, that's that's $1,000 a month. That's a lot of money. And uh, a lot of people in that situation, working class parents, poor parents, uh, are in states that voted for Trump. So if you look at the polling data, People love that policy, but they don't. But, but the ones who are Trump voters are not more inclined to vote for Biden because of it. And the reason is that the affinity of Trump voters for Trump is more personal, it's more tribal, it's more cultural. They think Democrats are cosmopolitans who are condescending towards working class people. And that's going to have to change a little bit at a time. Uh, the Democrats are going to have to have eight full years, which they may not get, uh, in order to really move that needle and win back the allegiance of some Trump voters. They only need to win back the allegiance of maybe 10% of them to really change the dynamics of American politics. I've just received another question. Um, you, is it in your experience? Um, is it is it is there enough um, effort to educate young people about the importance and advantages of social institutions, uh, state regulations, the welfare state, etc., in the U.S.? 
and what could be done to improve that? Well, you get some of it um, in universities. You, you the, the good politicians will take every opportunity they possibly can to teach lessons, to explain how the economy works, to explain uh, why unregulated capitalism doesn't work, to explain why social programs not only help people but make the economy more efficient, to explain the need for public investments. And the, the, the really good politicians use every speaking opportunity as a kind of teachable moment. And, uh, you know, you, you, you certainly don't get it in social media, which is totally superficial. And uh, a lot of younger people don't, don't read the serious press. And so I think it falls to uh, political leaders. Uh, it falls to other people who have audiences to try and teach younger people. And of course, younger people teach other younger people. All of the great social movements have been led by younger people and uh, they're going to have to teach each other. I have uh, one more question regarding culture politics because you, you mentioned it twice and in your lecture you, you said that culture politics, identity politics um, has interfered with class politics. Could you elaborate a little bit on that and is it necessarily a contradiction to be uh, economically left and culturally left as well? Um, well, let me put it this way. If you want to be culturally left, and there's nothing wrong with that, I consider myself culturally left. I'm green, I'm in favor of gay and lesbian rights, I'm in favor of immigrants' rights. But if you are going to be culturally left, you really have to deliver for working people. If you don't deliver for working people, then you lose them on the cultural issues. If you do deliver for working people, then you have a chance of keeping their support even though you are left on cultural issues. So there's a politician who I admire very much. He's a Democratic senator from Ohio. His name is Sherrod Brown. He is left on cultural issues, but he's the best trade unionist in Congress. And he's just fanatic on the need to create jobs in the United States and have high wages for workers. And he spends three quarters of his time standing up for working people and standing with working people. And so they forgive him for being liberal on gay and lesbian rights. Hillary Clinton was in the opposite quadrant. Hillary Clinton was very left wing on all the cultural issues and she took speaking fees from Goldman Sachs of half a million dollars. So if you are not sticking up for working people and you are left on cultural issues, forget it, you lose. I think uh, Nancy Fraser used the, 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 the phrase um, progressive neoliberalism. Yeah, and so it's culturally progressive, but it's economically neoliberal. And if you want more people like Kurtz and Trump, that's the recipe for you. I have one more question. Um, you say that the, the United States are a place of hope for us and you see the victory of Olaf Scholz and you see Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand being very successful. Um, are we witnessing a new rise of progressive social democratic parties uh, in the West or to use your words, um, are social Democrats back from the dead? Well, I hope so, but I think it's gonna be a very, very long road back. And I think we have to get very lucky. I, the, the more I read history, the more I'm impressed by the role of luck, of contingent events. And um, we got very, very lucky in 2020. We won two Senate seats that we were not supposed to win in both in Georgia. And as a result, Biden has control of the Senate. That wasn't supposed to happen. We also got very lucky in that there were a few honest people at the Justice Department who refused to do what Trump wanted them to do when he wanted them to steal the election. We got very lucky in that Vice President Pence, who was a complete 
partisan corrupt hack decided that his role in history was going to be to prevent Trump from stealing the election. Nobody would have predicted that. So we have to get equally lucky in 2022. Democrats have to hold on to both houses of Congress in the midterm election. And we have to get equally lucky in Europe. Uh, Schultz has to have a successful administration, has successful government. And somehow um, the, the FDP can't dictate to him the limits of his policies. And we have to get lucky in Austria, where we just got a little bit lucky. And maybe we can... <laughs> Maybe we can get even luckier. So, yeah, it's possible, but it's a long road back and everything has to break right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Bob, for your insights and inter interesting debate. It was a, a real pleasure and honor to, to talk with you. And uh, we really hope to you will visit us in Vienna in real life soon. I tried. Thank you so much. Um, and I will now switch to German back because... Um, für all jene, die gerne noch mehr von Robert Kartner hören wollen, er wird diese Woche, wie am Anfang schon angekündigt, im Rahmen der Veranstaltungsreihe Gegenbewegungen noch drei weitere Auftritte in Österreich haben. Und mehr Infos findet ihr unter vhs.at slash Gegenbewegungen. Dort findet ihr alle Veranstaltungen, wo ihr auch äh, im, im echten Leben mitdiskutieren könnt, morgen in der Oranie zum Beispiel. Ich sage an dieser Stelle noch stellvertretend für alle, die mitgewirkt haben, vielen Dank an Andreas Novi und das Internationale, die internationale karl polane gesellschaft in Wien für diese Gelegenheit und dass sie uns mit Robert Kattner in Verbindung gesetzt haben. Euch allen, die via Zoom, Facebook und Twitter dabei waren, Facebook natürlich auch, vielen Dank für die interessanten Fragen, vielen Dank fürs Mitmachen und schönen Abend. Danke sehr.